Hello, brothers and sisters. My name is Sandra Timko, and welcome to Lumen Christi. Matthew 5, verse 13 and 14 encourages us, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so your light must shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. There is a light shining brightly a short one hour from here. The light is brilliant and creative and thought-provoking. Can a light be thought-provoking? Yes, if it is encased in a wonderful servant of the Lord named Father Michael Savickas. And I'm not sure I pronounced that right, and he'll fix it for me. Father takes that precious time entrusted to him during his homilies at Holy Mass to incite the minds and hearts of his flock. His delivery of sacred scripture is always innovative. It's a gift he's been given, and a gift he shares so well. I want to share with you, my friend in Christ Jesus, my new friend, and who I count as a teacher, Father Michael. Welcome. Well, thank you, sure. and thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Um, I've been traveling over to your side of town. Yes, you have a number of times. Yep, seven years now, and um, I've been impressed with your delivery of the gospel. It's so um, life-giving. It's so it's it's so filled with enthusiasm. But before we talk about this wonderful gift that you share with your flock and visitors. I was impressed to read that you were raised in Detroit, and mm -hmm. at the young and tender age of what junior high, you entered sacred, uh, sacred seminary. Sacred Heart Seminary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, you ninth grade. That that's mm -hmm. so young. How did you know? And how did your parents feel? Oh, you didn't know at that time. You just uh, felt that there was an attraction that you were being called possibly to become a priest, and uh, uh, it, it's a time of testing. So you don't know it in ninth grade. Uh, I went to Precious Blood Pair School, uh, which was interesting back at that time. My goodness, you had uh, probably 60 some children in each class and three classes of each grade. A uh, very large school and uh, taught by the Dominican nuns, Dominican sisters. It was a, it was a really a good experience though. And, uh, and I think that's where I, I really had the first glimmerings of a vocation. Uh, parents, don't ever be afraid if you've got uh, um, young children to suggest to them they might have a calling to serve the church in some of, some more official capacity uh, as a priest, a deacon, as a, as a, a dedicated religious, or, um, or even as a, a, a dedicated layperson helping. Uh, the call, I think, kind of came early. I am fond of telling some of our children in our grade school today that um, when I look at the third graders at Mass and they say it was about in third grade that um, I think I started becoming sensitive to the idea that I could become a priest. Of course, at that time as a child, what do you know really about mm -hmm, this? Mm -hmm. But there was something attractive about it. And so uh, I happened to mention that to some of the sisters at, uh, at Precious Blood Parish. And it was amazing. From then on, my grades skyrocketed. <laughs> they just improved tremendously. It was <laughs> amazing. <laughs> they saw you as a future pastor, so probably. They were trying to help, help the cause, I think, a little bit. So your parents, how did they accept that? Were they um, thrilled? I know that there is probably a kind of a dichotomy when somebody mentions that they are thinking about a vocation. They see the, the blessings, but they also see the losses. So how, sure. how was yours? I, I think that's, uh, that you've hit it right on the money there. Uh, Dad was I'm not so sure about this. He was supportive. I mean, he drove me to the seminary on weekends, you know, too, so that I'd stayed there through the week, even beginning of ninth grade, I boarded. Uh, so he would drive me there, but we'd come home for weekends through high school. Uh, Mom was always very supportive. She thought it'd be great to have a priest in, our, in the family. Of course, coming from a, a, her, her maiden name was Paholsky, so you gotta expect that's, that's, that's okay in her eyes. Are there other brothers and sisters? Yes, I've got an older sister, uh, Lisa, and, uh, and a younger brother, Barry. So there's just you that opted for the religious life? That's right. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any regrets? Was there anything you felt you missed? Now that's an interesting question. I think we all have regrets about everything in our lives. We could have done something better, but looking back over the whole picture, absolutely not. Now this is where the Lord called me. This is what he wanted me to be. I don't think I could have been nearly the man I am now without being a priest. 
That's beautiful. I talked with a, a friend of mine who's just been a priest five years, and I said, do you ever regret not having children? He said, but I do. He said, I think of myself as the universal father. <laughs> And I have all of those children in our school, and every year there's new ones. And he said, Sandra, it's such a beautiful exchange of what I can give them and what they're mm -hmm. taking with me. And I just wondered if you felt the same. You have a Catholic school there. Mm -hmm. And how many children attend? Uh, we have a very small Catholic school rate at the, at the moment. We have about 110 that are uh, registered this year, plus an additional 23 pre-kindergartens, or, or what we call junior kindergartners, which really bodes well for the future. We've gone through a, a lot of places have actually, we've gone through a cycle where um, not as many children are being born in Catholic families. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm starting to see that beginning to turn around. It, that's a hopeful sign, I think. The other issue is that I think far, far, far too many of our Catholic people have become victims of secularization. Just because you're Catholic does not mean you're immune to the uh, forces of the world around us. And so priorities start getting a little bit out of whack. How so? Um, well, it's more like the, the families say, well, we've got to uh, keep our money because we want to give our children good experiences, like going to Disney World. Mm. You know, uh, uh, create some memories for them. Uh, so that's the, the advertising, and it's very expensive advertising that the world does to s persuade us that this is where you'll find happiness. I mean, uh, it's kind of silly when you think about it. I mean, who's going to really believe that if you just get the right kind of toothpaste that your life will be sublime? You know, that's just nonsense. But people hear that hammered at them over and over in all sorts of different ways, and they begin believing it. And we haven't done as good a job, I think, as church presenting Jesus mm -hmm. as a really good deal. Mm -hmm. And so people are kind of got caught up into secularization. Uh, their values are, are, are not primarily for the church. They're jealous of their time. They're overwhelmed in our society with uh, pressures on their time. Uh, the kids go to dance, they go to hockey, they go to sports, they go to soccer, they go to uh, after school activities, all kinds of things. And there's just not enough time left in the day. For and so they, they stop uh, spending as much effort at say attending mass on Sundays, right. coming together, creating those memories with their children, right? Um, and so they kind of lose out when they don't have that that level of uh, excitement about the Lord, and it's not as big a part of their life. Then priorities being what they are, and Catholic schools costing some money, costing some time and energy, uh, that it declines. And so, to actually amazingly, is the after school programs. It still takes time and energy to bring your kids. And not as many of our Catholic parents are bringing their kids as should be. But that's an obligation we make at the time of baptism, sure that we is. raise them up in the faith. And what greater can you give your child but the promise of eternal life and the constant grace that they'll receive through confession and communion for the rest of their life? and the protection of, of confirmation and the being introduced to the Holy Spirit. I mean, what amount of dance classes or what amount of iPods and phone apps are more important in the big picture? I mean, that's, that's really disappointing to hear. Yeah, you've got that exactly right. What the greatest gift that a parent can give to his or her child is the gift of faith. Mm -hmm. And to let that child become aware that they are children of God that they have a special place. Um, just last week on our uh, weekday school mass, and near the end of the mass, um, I invited the, everybody in the, in, in the church, really, uh, kids as well. I say, do you really believe, so turn to the person next to you mm -hmm. and ask this question, do you know that God the Father loves you? And the kids had a great time doing that. It got very noisy and loud, of course, and the kids were smiling and back and forth. But I sometimes I think we forget that, that God the Father loves us, but that because of that, we, in our gratitude, want to respond to God. We want to give something back to Him. And what's coming to Mass on Sunday? How much time is that? 30, uh, 60 minutes out of, a, out of an incredibly busy week. Right. Um, now I think, I, I, please correct me if I don't get my math wrong. I think there's 1,440 minutes in each day. I, I could be wrong. I just, I just thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the oh, Lord only asks us just to come to me and remember, to put him first in the list of priorities, not if you happen to be able to have enough time to squeeze him in if you get around to it. 
that's so damaging because as parents, there's nothing greater we can give our children. And the priority before anything should be, should be God, should be Jesus, should be the Holy Spirit. I, um, I know when I taught religious education for years, in the class, the last class I taught, there were 28 children, which was rather large, and only two children were brought to Mass on a regular basis. I, I was mm. devastated by that. You can't expect somebody that has your ch child for an hour a week to be able to give them everything that they need for a foundational relationship with Christ. No, the religious education classes or the, the, whole, all the, the whole environment, a total environment within a Catholic school of, that's in a religious, uh, loving, hopefully loving environment is only a reinforcement of what should be happening in the home. Mm -hmm. The parents need to pray with their kids. Mm -hmm. The parents need to share their stories about when they were a little girl, a little boy, and how their parents prayed with them. Uh, they need to share the stories about what the uh, family did on, on birthdays and holidays and how they had those traditions. Traditions are simply, it's not a bad word by the way, it's, it's just what is handed on mm -hmm. is traditio, what's handed on is a tradition. The parents need to share that because, uh, and, and especially those meals, those meals, a special meal, mm -hmm. you know, where you, you're not sitting in front of the TV with a TV tray, you're actually sitting down to a family meal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and sometimes it's even important to pull out the good silverware and put a tablecloth oh, on it. And it's fun. And, and you have the candles on the table mm -hmm. and, and you share some joys and sorrows and people get on each other's case and they forgive and they laugh and they cry and they do all those things at a family meal. If p families don't take the time to do that because they're so busy, how on earth are the children going to recognize that Eucharistic meal which has all those same characteristics? Mm -hmm. If families don't eat together, they're going to lose their identity. The kids won't know who they are. Mm -hmm. If the Christian family doesn't toge come together at the table of the Lord, they lose their identity. They forget who they are. Mm -hmm. you know. Again, this is Father Mike from um, St. William St. William's and, Church on Wall Lake. Lake. <laughs> and he's an amazing man. He has an amazing gift of making the this, the uh, sacred scripture come to life. And I was telling my friend the other day, I said, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity that a priest or a pastor or a preacher <clears throat> is given one hour during a service, uh, a one hour service, to have 10, 15, 20 minutes to make that scripture come alive, to incite people's um, faith walk, to give them a new perception of um, possibilities. And I, f I feel you do that so well. I visit many, many churches, and I see where some people look like they have become mundane in it because it's just part of the job. And I think it would be so awesome to have that opportunity face to face with people and bring it all to life. Is this something that you recognized you were gifted in right from the beginning, or has it grown as the Holy Spirit has moved in you? Oh, oh yes. Uh, I think, in, in fact, let's go back again to third grade. Okay. Okay. Um, I remember sitting in a in a large, huge church at Precious Blood, and of course that was back with Latin Mass, and uh, and people were all just people would come to Mass though, mm -hmm. <laughs> regardless they didn't have to necessarily understand everything. They knew they were supposed to be there. They were there. I can remember my mother uh, when I was just a little tyke, maybe even younger, say six, seven, eight years old, and uh, at communion time, all the people are moving and they're moving out, and I thought they were leaving. You know. And so I politely said to mom, suggested to her, is, uh, uh, you know, all those people are going, can't we leave too? And turns out we couldn't, um, because mom knew something that we I didn't, didn't at age six or seven, uh, and that's not over till it's over, and we're here for a sacred reason. But during that time, there would be a homily. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't, didn't call it a homily, then we called it a sermon. sermon. Okay. And I remember being there in about third grade and bored silly, thinking, oh, I could do better than that. Oh, did you really? I really thought that, and I think at that point, God said, oh, yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> wow. And so I think that's where it kind of blossomed from. And, and uh, ever since then, I think the idea of preaching has been important as yeah. part of my ministry of priesthood. Uh, it's, it is, as you said, a chance to be able to communicate to the people. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and I have a few uh, uh, things I cheat about though with us because I always cheat by getting making sure that we get people to pray before the homily. Do you? That's uh, so very wise. very frequently, um, especially if I'm struggling with because it's not me. It's got to be the Lord coming across. Right. I sometimes pray that no matter what I say, I hope the people hear what they're supposed to hear. Mm -hmm. And um, when I get up to, to preach, uh, I always, you know, as you're crossing in front of the altar, mm -hmm. uh, I stop, I pause, I pray. And I, I pray a prayer. I think I've done this now for 40 years, just about 40 years. I don't think there's been a homily that I haven't done this, whereas I'm walking out to preach. Uh, I stop and I say this prayer. I say, Lord, I claim your gift. Oh. Early on in my priesthood, I was at the first parish I was at. Um, there was a, a small group, I can't remember the exact setting, but it was just like maybe three of us uh, praying and, um, in a prayerful setting. And there was one lady there, I don't even remember her name now. Uh, she didn't really know me. Uh, but she knew that I was a priest beyond that. And we were praying together and she prayed over me, as, as will happen when mm -hmm. sometimes when you get a group of people right. praying together. Uh, we're learning how to do this in our Christ life uh, mm -hmm. experience for the parishioners in general at, at St. William. Uh, how to pray with people. And she's praying and she, I think, spoke a prophetic word. Now prophecy, some people think that it's about the future. It's, it's really to speak the word of God that the people need to hear at that moment. Right. That's all prophecy is. Okay? And she spoke, I think, a prophetic word. She says, you have the gift of preaching. Mm. And uh, so I, I heard that, and as I said, I don't think there's been a, a time that I've stepped up to preach that I didn't claim the gift. And, and it's so beautiful. It's, it's just so far, it's so far reaching. Uh, we're going to spend two segments talking to Father. Our time together is nearly coming to an end here. And what I wanted you to talk about in the next segment is some of your favorite scriptures, but also if you would share with our audience what I, I talked to you about last um, Lent, I asked you to repeat what you had said. You talked about forgiveness. So the for steps for forgiveness. Yes. yes. And I think it's so healthy th that people hear that. You did it in such a beautiful, simple fashion that it's easy to digest and apply to our life. Um, your favorite part of being a priest? Uh, besides, besides preaching, mm -hmm. which again, it's a mixed bag, you understand, mm -hmm. because uh, it's not that it's easy or that you just get up there and, uh, and, and it's, no, you have to work at it, mm -hmm. and it's stressful. I remember for the first seven years as a priest, I don't think there was a time I got up for Sunday Mass to preach where I wasn't like physically ill before. Really? You know, you just, oh, you're getting all knotted up in you. Why, why well, was that? Because you know that this is important. And, and, uh, and so you, you experience some stress in that. You want to do a good job. You want to pray. And sometimes I know I don't have it all. And so that's when I also add a, a little prayer to that, uh, Lord, I claim your gift. I also say, uh, uh, Lord, uh, uncork one for your people, okay? Because they need to hear it. Mm -hmm. And so often it's, um, it's, it just comes across that it's not me doing it. It's the Lord giving the gift. Mm -hmm. And he wants to, as St. Paul said, there's gifts but they're for the buildup of the body of Christ, right. not for individual right. uh, you know, enhancement. So. Right, right. When you... Um, well, you would, did mention what's the other favorite part, though. Oh, of course. Okay. And so preaching is certainly, certainly very important to me. Um, uh, the other favorite part, I think, and it's true of an awful lot of priests, is the sacrament of reconciliation. I swear to you, that's what I, I was going <laughs> to... I, I know I we didn't practice this or anything, but it's absolutely true. There's something just wowing mm -hmm. uh, when you can have a person who's truly been stressed, they know they've done wrong, they're hurting, they're burdened, and they have, have chains set free mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. And it might be a, a person that's coming maybe for many, many years not having been reconciled. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just, can, can God even forgive me? And they, they let it all out. They, and you can go with the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, the authority that he gave to his church, and say, in the name of the Lord. It's the Lord who forgives, but he's doing it through us. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. 
through the ministry of the church. May God give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And sometimes you, you just, the persons, you know, they just are burdened. Yes. What a gift to be able to set people free. Yeah. It's so funny because you got ready to answer. And I saw the inside of the confessional with you the last time I was there. And I, I thought, Confe and then you spoke it. Confession, you do such a beautiful job. You're such a gentle man. And you said to me, the last time I went to confession to you was right before Holy Week. I mean, I've gone since, but I mean to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That'd be frightening. Um, you, you said, let's not forget Mary's Magnificat. Mm -hmm. And you said, Sandra, contemplate that. Ponder it. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting up and thinking, oh my goodness, what a beautiful, what a beautiful penance. It's no penance at all. It's, it's a pleasure to try to understand her level of surrender greater. And you offered it so beautifully. I encourage everyone that's listening to this program that has denied themselves the healing presence and the joy of new life to go to confession. There's not a thing that they haven't heard before. Don't let the enemy rob you of, of new life. There's not a new sin under the sun. Don't let your pride keep you from going. Um, the reality is, he wants to give you something new. And time's running out. We've got to make the necessary changes. And these priests are acting in the capacity of Jesus himself. There's no condemnation here. There's healing. There's healing. And you do such a fabulous job. Now, do you have confession just on Saturdays, or do you offer it during that's, the week? That's the, the regular time that it's scheduled. is at 3.30 and on Saturday afternoon. The priest that has a 4.30 Mass is coming to help. and. Here's confessions at 3.30 in Advent and Lent. We start at 3 o'clock. But then there's other times, of course. If and someone is, is... If anybody wants to, they call. Uh, if they need to, especially if they need some extra time, uh, they'll call. We'll just set up a time. You go over to the church or even my office, and we, we uh, celebrate the Sacrament of Reconciliation. It's As so you true. said, it's nothing to be afraid of. No. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's, uh, I mean, we'll be getting into that in the next session mm -hmm. it, th to understand why it's, it's so freeing to be able to come to a priest mm -hmm. and confess. I mean, people will ask that question. We'll, I'll tell, we'll have a teaser. We'll, we'll answer that next <laughs> okay, time. Okay, here's the question. Yeah, here's the question. Why do you have to go to a priest? Why can't I just go to God? Mm -hmm. Very good question. There's a great answer. Okay. Give us a little blessing after I read this closing, all right? And thank you so much You're for welcome, accepting Santa. this invitation because I've been so mm -hmm. blessed by Father. I just figured you'd be too. In closing, our reminder comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for refutation and correction, and for training in righteousness, so that one who belongs to God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So don't waste any more time. Get to confession. And as always, remember to let Christ's light shine through you. Almighty God, we do thank and praise you for the great gifts with which you fill our lives gifts of life, and love, and family, and friends. The gift of the church, the gift of your son Jesus, the gift of reconciliation and peace. We do pray especially, Lord, for those who are struggling with an unrepented sin or a sin that they don't think they can be given, forgiven for, that you set their hearts and minds free and bring them to a, a minister of reconciliation for them. We ask for your blessing now to be upon us and upon all who produce this show and all who listen to it. We call down the blessing of Almighty God in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As always, remember to let Christ's light shine through you.
sin.